but ultimately we need to focus on building an alternative. And the more that we can build and show people that, hey, there's another way to live, there's another way to raise your kids, there's another way to eat food from locally sourced material, there's another way to interact with the land, there's another way to steward the land, there's another way to communicate and another way to trade amongst ourselves. And most importantly, another way to organize ourselves as a social organism so we can make group decisions, uh, organized effort back to Napoleon Hill, he said, and think and grow rich. Uh, I think that's really important to not only experiment with new ways of doing things, which in many ways are a return to the old ways, the traditional ways, but also to broadcast that. Because if we can show at least some of the masses that you don't have to go to the digital panopticon prison central bank digital currency 15 minute city world there's actually you can actually earn a living you could provide for your family and you can live a good life outside of the smart city over here with us we're doing cool stuff the more people that we have standing with us it makes it easier to say no is one thing that i've come to find uh also having faith that we're good people we're not doing anything wrong by rejecting this beast system you know we stand in our power to to live as free people And good afternoon, everyone. John Bush with me today. LiveFreeAcademy.com. You remember our talk from, it's been a little over a year, no, more, a little more, a year and a half. Uh, we were talking general trends on how we both saw the way the world it was going to bend in a certain direction. Not every specific along the way, but the generality. We could definitely, we both had the trend and we both were just following it. And where do we sit today? Where we talked about with our conversation. So we thought we kind of updated and then give another idea of where we both see this society being taken out with banking, finance, real estate prices, land availability, and a whole bunch of other things, because you're going to get way more self-sufficient really fast, or you're going to be needing to join the community, because food prices, in my opinion, are just going only one direction and way faster than the last couple of years. It seems like it's accelerating right now. Exit and Build Land Summit 4 and, you know, I was looking at the site of the uh, event you're going to be hosting here, and like, J.P. Sears, who I know, Joel Salatin, we went up to his farm in Virginia, as a matter of fact. We drove up there and stayed up there. Uh, he wasn't there, but we got to take the full tour, run around. I got to interview his son, did a thing about that. I know Mike because I'm on his uh, Bright on TV every other Friday, 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Jack Sprico. I mean, there's a whole bunch of information coming out, so that's why I wanted to bring John on and actually catch up more than anything, but this is fortuitous timing where the event's going to be uh, happening at the same time. So floor is yours. What's new and, and exciting that uh, that you see is an opportunity for somebody versus everybody's focused on the negative right now. So where's the opportunity? I guess we start the conversation that way. That's a great question. And uh, it's always great to catch up and uh, hear more about what you got going on in your neck of the woods. So yeah, we got this big event coming up and we're bringing people together. And the whole purpose of the event is to empower people. So just as you said, a lot of people get caught in this hypnotic rhythm. I'm studying deeper Napoleon Hill. You know, he wrote Think and Grow Rich, but he's got all these other great works. The one I'm currently reading is called Outwitting the Devil. And he has a conversation with the devil and the devils who puts people into fear, which leads them to drift. And you have two choices when things happen. You can either go into a state of fear or you can go into faith where you believe in yourself and you believe everything's going to be okay. You believe in your abilities. Uh, anyway, he presents this concept of hypnotic rhythm. So, oh, there you go. Excellent, excellent. Yep. Now, that's a I classic. Have bookmarks in it, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> There's some good knowledge in that one. But the event is going to be all about solutions, empowering people, helping people break through limiting beliefs, because the tactics and the strategies and the how-to tends to be the easy part. David Brady warns the S&P could nosedive to 1,000 points, erasing 14 years of gains. CEOs like Jamie Dimon have been warning about 70s era stagflation. The 70s were a lost decade for the stock market, but gold and silver exploded higher. From 1972 to 1974, gold gained 240% and silver surged 315%. Call the proud Americans of the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late. Also, Patriot Gold Group has a no fee for life IRA where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold or silver. No fee for life IRA on qualifying rollovers. Give them a call 
546-7020. And now on with the video. Uh, the challenge a lot of people come up against is whenever they face adversity, whenever they can't figure something out, or whenever they put a lot of energy into something and then it falls apart, people have a tendency to give up and quit, right? So the event will help to do that. And that's a great way to, to start the conversation, focusing on opportunities. And one thing that I've found, because I've been doing freedom and truth activism for, for 22 years now, more than half of my entire life has been on this path. And um, I think that for people that are looking to leave their corporate job or create a lifestyle where they're able to go out and homestead and spend significant energy being more prepared with them and their family, there's I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity in creating goods and services, business opportunities that cater to this freedom community, this freedom movement. It's growing by leaps and bounds. And I've seen it surge over the years. It had a huge uptick after uh, Ron Paul ran for president, right? And then, of course, after the bailouts in 2007, 2008, 2009, a lot of people woke up and were like, wait, I'm struggling financially, but you're giving all these billions of dollars to these banks. That was when it was, it was like $700 billion. Now that's coming out of nowhere so fast. That's not even a big deal. 700 billion. That's what <laughs> goes over to Ukraine, you know? Um, so yeah, I think there'll be opportunities if people can position themselves to provide services, support, guidance, housing, um, any, there's going to be a whole industry that grows around this whole freedom thing, getting more prepared, exiting those old systems, more decentralized. So that's just where I went with that. What opportunities are out there. People have an opportunity to cater to this growing movement uh, where a lot of people are looking for support. Yeah, I know. And that's one of the biggest things. You know, a lot of people get up to that point where they put a lot of work in and they fail and they quit because it didn't work. But that's just your first step to learn what yeah. didn't work so well that you can revamp the strategy. Gardening, growing food is going to be the same thing. Construction, building something, the same thing. It doesn't matter you know, how many times you cut a piece of wood, you can always do it a little bit better to get it fit, fit a little bit better, or a little more square. Don't ever give up. You know, the gardens, I'm up to hay bale gardening now outside the earth gardens and doing uh, vertical gardens with electricity and LED grow lights. It's oh. like stepping it from a seed in the ground is where I started and then, you know, moving up. So there's all these opportunities, you know, endless opportunity. I think there's more opportunities now with the collapse of the system and with the actual reset of the system. We're moving to so many new things all at the same time. So there's, like you say, there's going to be a lot of services and setups and maintenance and, you know, cooperation of time banks and this sort of thing should jump. Also, one thing uh, a friend of mine was saying, yeah, you know, we could trade and barter during this time. It's a great time. You know, you got a lot of things you could do, skills or silver. But, you know, we had the conversation like, yeah, we got a lot of one ounce rounds of silver. OK, but then I give you an ounce. And if it really does go up to four hundred dollars, two hundred, three hundred, whatever the price it is. Can you make change for an ounce of silver? So we're challenging ourselves this next month or whatever, if we go out with friends and whatever, their wives and our wives and make change with everything in silver. <laughs> like, how do you break a one ounce round and give silver value back? Because see, these are some of the skills that are going to have to be needed. But again, do you have the ability to take a silver round and turn it into an ingot and weigh it out and cut it into a quarter ounce yourself? I mean, there's just so many opportunities I mean, blacksmithing is going to come back, but it'll be metal foundry to take some of the precious metals to cut them into pieces for tradables. I mean, there's so many possibilities. And I was going somewhere with that, but I lost my thoughts. So back to well, you. I know somebody doing that, actually. Uh, of course, you got silver dimes, right? Junk silver. So it's silver dimes, quarters, half dollars, 1964 and before are 90 percent silver. So the dimes are at least smaller. Um, and then I know somebody's name Silver Dave. Um, he's up in New Hampshire and they actually started doing these little 10th ounce rectangle, a 10th of an ounce, which is pretty cool. And then there's also those gold backs. It's like this gold paper. It it's like the size of money, a little smaller, and it's a thin layer of gold. So, you know, you could put it in your wallet and they have different denominations. I think they started like five bucks, 10 bucks, something like that. There's, there's options out there and people are going to need those options. And, I think there's also going to be a return. I do, you know, we have the homestead and stuff. And in all honesty, I'm trying to balance out. So I'm spending more time at the homestead, doing the homesteading, uh, less time here at the office. We're hoping to actually get a new property where there's the office on the homestead as well. But uh, there's going to be a resurgence of hands-on practical skills. 
which is great because a lot of people, you know, they'll complain about opportunity or it's hard to work my way up the ladder to make more money, yada, yada, yada. But anybody could go out and learn these practical trades, right? It just takes getting your hands dirty. Experience is the greatest teacher. So economies are shifting. Now, mind you, a significant majority of the masses, so to speak, they're going to shift into uh, the fourth industrial revolution and what the Great Reset is pushing. And they're most definitely advancing that. But that doesn't mean that we have to go along with it. My friend Derek Rose describes this fracturing that's taking place, a literal fracturing of society where there's people that are just going along, get along. They're carrying out a program. They're the drifters, like Napoleon Hill said. And uh, I'm not sure they're going to really do much of anything except what they're told to do. Uh, some of our family members may be in that camp, and so we could try to help them the best of our ability. But ultimately, we need to focus on building an alternative. And the more that we can build and show people that, hey, there's another way to live. There's another way to raise your kids. There's another way to eat food from locally sourced material. There's another way to interact with the land. There's another way to steward the land. There's another way to communicate and another way to trade amongst ourselves. And most importantly, another way to organize ourselves as a social organism so we can make group decisions, uh, organized effort back to Napoleon Hill, he said, and think and grow rich. Uh, I think that's really important to not only experiment with new ways of doing things, which in many ways are a return to the old ways, the traditional ways, but also to broadcast that. Because if we can show at least some of the masses that you don't have to go to the digital panopticon prison central bank digital currency, 15 minute city world, there's actually, you can actually earn a living, you could provide for your family and you can live a good life outside of the smart city over here with us. We're doing cool stuff. Come check us out. We're normal people. We're not all weird kooks or any, well, at least most of us aren't. Uh, then uh, I think that's an important thing too. And shows like this and, and building and then showing people, hey, look what we did. You, you should do this too. And you could join us. We could learn from each other. I think that's really going to help uh, provide a kind of like a safety net for people to come to escape the matrix, so to speak. Yeah, it's the mind frame of <clears throat> the change of value more than the change of money, because as this new system emerges and there's going to be, you know, a ripping of old systems and it's not going to be an easy, it's just going to rip. And then people are going to have to deal with it and, you know, fit in new ways. The, the rip and tear is going to be faster in some areas than others, obviously, but the world that we're moving into is definitely a change. So it shouldn't be about making money <clears throat> as you think. It's more about the passion and the, the better passion, the more passion you have <clears throat> equals higher quality product on the backside. And truly the quality product that you're making, producing, whatever it is, that's where the value is. And that's how the new value shall be established, whether it's trading, whether it's actually selling something in the new money tin or the new monetary system. But we do have a choice, and that's the whole thing. This <clears throat> media monster has told us that there's only one choice. It's their way or the highway, and that's it. You got no choice. You just have to go with it. I don't believe that. They're terrified of people like us talking and saying there is a different alternative. We don't all have to accept that blindly. We don't. And if enough people were to say that, that would stop as quickly as every other chapter of history. We said enough is enough, and it always stops when enough people say it. But until we get that rollover point, 50%, 20%, whatever, you know, studies have shown that that one last person that trips the cycle over and then enough people have said, no, I don't accept it. And that narrative dies on the vine. It never comes back. Nobody will accept it. And that's where we need to take our minds as well. Value and that also that we just say no. We literally say no. We've created yeah, our reality then. Yeah, we got to say no. And peaceful, nonviolent resistance. Um the more people that we have standing with us, it makes it easier to say no is one thing that I've come to find. Uh, also having faith that we're good people. We're not doing anything wrong by rejecting this beast system. You know, we stand in our power to, to live as free people. You know, regarding the value thing, I did this little, um, this little two hour session for my Live Free Academy members a while back, and it was called Building Community uh, Through Reciprocity, something like that. But the idea was, one of the most valuable things that we can do now is, is create value reciprocally on a grassroots mutual aid level with our friends and our community. And uh, I had this insight one day walking around our property, you know, it's also the, 
it is really important to own land and or at least to be partnered with someone that owns land or to have an RV on someone's land spot or whatever, just to get out in get to the land. It's, it's important in so many ways. And if, you're, and if it's somebody that has built wealth for themselves, it's a great way to protect that wealth and to have that land, which isn't going to go down in value. Even if it does go down in value, it's less relevant because you have an asset that could produce fruit for you and a place to go and a place to be. Uh, but I was walking around our, our 10 acre homestead and we had some seed starters going here and the garden was over there. We just built out the chicken coop and I looked over and we have these two RVs. We have two really close friends that live on the property like I shared. And I was just and the, it was at a time when all the food crisis talk and the supply chain disruption was still a big issue after COVID. Right. Because it was a big issue at first and then it kind of settled down and then we started to really feel the effects still are feeling the effects. But anyway, I was just walking through just thinking like. We're going to be OK if everything collapses. I mean, obviously, I don't want it to happen and it's not going to be easy. There's definitely going to be challenges and hardships, but we're going to survive. And in fact, maybe we'll thrive because we'll continue. It'll accelerate the work that we're doing. And then I started thinking about the community that we have. And in fact, more recently, I went on a date uh, downtown Bastrop, the small town that we live near. It's like 7,000 or 8,000 people. And we were sitting down at this nice restaurant that sources food from a farm down the street. It's called Storehouse. And I was looking out the window at downtown Bastrop on Main Street. Simple, quaint. It's not a big town, but it's got a nice Texas town feel to it. Uh, we're actually hosting the event right up the road at the Bastrop Convention Center. And I was thinking to myself, like, all right, let's say there is a, a dollar collapse. Uh, the federal government fails. There's a dirty bomb or some crazy attack in a major city, L.A., Washington, whatever. Things are going to get really crazy fast, and especially the markets. The economy is going to screech to a halt. But I was thinking like, okay, what about the people walking by right now? What about the old fifth generation Texas rancher down the street? This shopkeep that just busted his butt to keep the place open. Some things are going to go away, like the, uh, like the antique store and the craft stores that are part of a posh downtown. There's not really going to be a demand for that anymore. But ultimately, I think, especially in small rural America, people are slowly but surely going to pick the pieces up again. And it's not going to be like total Mad Max society overnight. The cities, I believe, are going to be crazy chaotic. But we can hope that the good people of this country, of this world, uh, can come together peacefully. And I, again, there's a greater tendency for that to happen in more conservative, higher val you know, value, Christian values just people that are good people instead of a lot of the degeneracy that's going on in the city and a lot of crime and just a lot of trouble. Um, that was the kind of thinking that I always had. I, I don't know what you think about that because it can go hardcore extreme um, or, you know, things can be a little bit more subtle or it's extreme in some areas. That's what you said a second ago. The, the ripple happened more severely in some areas. What are your thoughts on that? Since I've been talking with the adapt 2030 channel, most people have told me four months is the average that you would need to, hold out or be self-sufficient until things, like you said, started to come back together on the local community level, because nobody's going to exist in that squalor or whatever ripped apart, you know, society that's fed back to us. And we're, we're nobody's just going to sit there and just blindly accept that. We know that it can be repaired at least to some level. So the brokenness of it that we would all witness is like, eh, you know, we can build it back locally. And I hate that build it back better thing. They kind of hijack that you know, nomenclature for a better term. Uh, so if you do want to build back your communities after a disaster or something, kind of, oh, they already got you cornered on the lexicon there. But local communities will take care of themselves. And, you know, you look, right now it's coming in, luckily, to spring and then summer. There'd be an abundance of food. I mean, it just depends on where everything finally settles out, but four months seems to be the average amount of time that you would need to live through something like this. So who has land? I mean, four months in a city is a very, very, very long time, especially if you're the only one cooking and the whole neighborhood can smell it. Everything else is turned <laughs> off for four months. I mean, we got we can go back to the old school. You ever seen those tools and thing? They called lanterns. You usually <laughs> mention antique shop. I laugh because I have those kerosene lanterns on purpose. Because if your lights go out, all you need is the kerosene and you just turn those things back up. Lamp fuel burns, you know, cleaner. So I got a bunch of lamp fuel oil too, but in a pinch, I could do kerosene again. But I mean, 
I live near the Amish, so I always see how they're back in time. And I know that many, if you just had the right neighbors, the right mindset, the right old tools from those mm -hmm. antique shops, that you could live four months. It wouldn't be, uh, it would be pioneering, but you could definitely do it as long as the people cooperate and work together in the community. And that's what the city doesn't have or won't have. But I'm sure in times of duress, the neighbors will even get tighter because you know you can trust that person. You've seen them for a few years. You've been around this you know, community for long enough. They know who the bad people are already. Guaranteed, it's a small town. You say 5,000, I live a place with 1,000. They know who the bad characters are already. It's even a smaller, you know? And so how, where do you find your niche in there? Like what skills do you have that you could bring at that time and knock on the door and say, hey, I can do this? Mm -hmm. Like for you, you know, John, what do you think the most valuable would be in a list of things to learn or that people can start to learn right away? Well, for me personally, you know, one of the, my most valuable present skills now is marketing, um, which of course with an online business and all these events is super valuable that that type of thing would change with e-commerce online. I know how to build a funnel, for example, right? A sales page, uh, but getting the word out about things, there's still going to be small micro industry. Um, but I think probably the most useful skill that I have that would be valuable in one of these scenarios is, is helping to organize people, being a leader. Um, because, you know, people get freaked out, people get chaotic. And sometimes, well, not sometimes, all the time, it's useful to have somebody that can help coordinate and organize. And that's one of the pieces, that's one of the things that'll help to build things back with some coordination amongst neighbors and such. But for anybody, you know, being able to grow food, like you said earlier, uh, blacksmithing, I mean, oh my goodness, what a valuable trade that would be. Because I guess, you know, after a certain time, like you said, that's why it's have, good to have good old reliable tools because after a certain amount of time maybe almost instantly if there's uh looting you know the home depot and the lows will get picked through um thankfully in the country people have those skills they have those tools there's ranches there's little mechanic shops and such so i think the important thing though is for people to learn those skills now and the beauty of it is this is what jack spierko who's, who's speaking it's his tagline he teaches you things if for if time gets tough or even if they don't. So in the present moment, even if crap doesn't hit the fan anytime soon, it's, it's inevitable, but maybe it takes a little longer than we suspected. Um, it still would be valuable to know how to grow food, to know how to do some basic carpentry, uh, to know how, I mean, I guess painting houses won't be too important. And in in eventually it'll be, let's get back to the good old days and make the house, the wives will want the house to look nice on the outside and such. But yeah, I would just say real world skills that have to do with food, water, shelter, uh, security as well. So, um, but the thing to do is to learn that stuff now, to practice that stuff now, whether you're in the city or you're in the country. If you're in the city, in the suburbs, and you got any decent size of a backyard, there's plenty of space to start gardening, even if it's a container garden uh, and you're on somebody's, uh, on your, it's on your back patio at your apartment. Because I don't know about you, David, but it's, uh, we've actually struggled the past few growing seasons to really produce solid. The garden's doing the best that it has so far since we moved to this place in 2021. We've had some terrible heat, uh, very little rain. Thankfully, it's raining more this season. Um, but it's not the easiest thing. It's definitely not the easiest thing. In fact, it's very difficult to produce enough food for you and your family from your own property. You, you almost always have to supplement with the local cattle ranch down the road um, and, and the farmer's market, the community supported agriculture. So I guess to wrap up, the point I would make is go ahead and build those skills now, but also build those relationships now because we have some local cattle ranchers that do regenerative practices. In fact, I recently bought half a butchered cow and I paid with Bitcoin, which is pretty cool, right? So we're using alternative food sources from our friends and we're paying with alternative money. Um, but you can bet though, if crap really hits the fan, these local cattle ranchers we're friends with, they're going to get leaned on pretty hard. They're going to have a whole lot of business. Maybe they'll even raise their prices in order to keep up with demand. I don't know how they'll manage that, but there's only so much cattle that they have. So it's in your interest to have those tight knit relationships to provide value to them, to do business with them now and be a good steward beyond just buying things. Tell your friends about them, show up to their place, just be nice and friendly. It's that reciprocity I was mentioning earlier. So those are some things that, that I would be aware of. Not only learn the skills yourself, but know the people that you need to go to in order to 
uh, fill in the gaps of the skills that you don't have. Yeah, you mentioned animals. One thing I learned to do was butcher small animals. So we had sheep here and also I buy my lambs from the Amish. And I'll take that whole animal and I will be able to process that animal, 110 pound lamb into, it goes into the freezer. That's you know, I, I still need to watch a, a little bit of, uh, you know, some butcher videos that are specifically sure. for lamb cuts. But the same thing, cow, we tried it once, it, nightmare. Never do it again. Go to the butcher That's all the time. Undertaking. Wow. Yeah. Do you, but, you know, you even know the basics of filling out a cut sheet. And do you know, you're going to have to wait quite a while. You just can't rock up to a butcher and be like, yo, man, I got a cow. Can I get it in tomorrow? That just doesn't happen. You, you're weeks or months out, depending on what time of the, if it's hunting season and they do deer also at the same time, you're impossible. You're going to wait forever. No, I was just saying, imagine if no one if no one can get beef at the grocery store too, the, the local butcher, the local cattle rancher, they're going to be completely overwhelmed. So you got to figure out some of it on your own for sure. Man, yeah, that's lambs pretty. Good. At that, rustling cattle is going to be a real thing. Rustling lambs, rustling pigs or chickens. Somebody might come in and try to steal your live animals, you know. And then, you know, these ranchers are going to get very, very, very protective. And you're going to be on their land at the wrong time. And so then it takes us back to Wild West kind of style because they are going to protect the cattle from rustlers. Literally stepping back 150, 180 years in time. We're just doing a circle on it. Yeah. And, you know, for, for livestock meat, I found the chickens. Chickens are what I'm most comfortable with, right? They're the simplest. They're easy to maintain. Just got to keep the predators out, feed them some good organic feed, let them free range. Uh, and they're the easiest to butcher as well. In fact, we just, I hadn't butchered a chicken in, uh, I don't know, maybe seven years or eight years. Cause we, I was living in the city for a while. I had a homestead, two and a half acre homestead. That's where my kids were born. My dogs were buried. Um, that was with my ex-wife that marriage did not end up working out, but it was some good times. We had a homestead. We had 120 chickens at one point, a bunch of Google culture gardens. Yeah, it was cool. And we would slaughter all the time. Anyway, we lost that opportunity. That, speaking of adversity, that was a really challenging point in my life. I had to move into this broken down, converted school bus that was rusting apart and very, very rough patch. But I learned from it. You know, I let the adversity actually strengthen my my confidence, my ability to deal with those troubles because that's what life is all about. It's not always just easy peasy. And we got something. You know, we got another thing coming to us if we think it's going to get any easier. But um, I found that chickens, in fact, I found chickens were easier to, to raise and keep for food than growing vegetables, in my opinion. The eggs are just coming out plentiful. Uh, ideally, they'll, they'll go and roost and they'll hatch their own little chicks or you can get a little hatcher. Um, but learning to slaughter on a chicken, of course, is the first stepping stone. And even if that's as far as you go, if you have a flock that you protect from predators and from humans that are coming in, right, to poach them, like you're saying, uh, then I think that's a good start for sure. And that's another thing that people could do if they have, uh, even if they're in a single family neighborhood. Now, the, here's a pro tip. You may not want to get a rooster because uh, your neighbors will get upset. But the best way to overcome that is as soon as you get a, your first dozen of eggs, you bring it over next door to your neighbors. And then that's how they maybe won't call uh, call you out if you got an HOA that prohibits chickens or something like that. Freest country in the world, John. Freest country in the world. <laughs> Can't have chickens at my own private house. HOA said so. They trumped the Constitution. It's unbelievable. Uh, oh, yeah, those kiss my grits, you know. Yeah, well, we don't have to worry about that out in the country. That's for sure. Yeah, no, Your you, neighbor, you, know. like, you don't have chickens? How come you don't have chickens? <laughs> That's what they say in the country. Yeah. You want some of my flock? <laughs> I'll give you a couple of roosters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks. yeah, we got some to get rid of. Yeah, you yes, could take a rooster. I was going to say we just slaughtered a rooster and my son actually helped uh, cuz over at his mom's house they have a bunch of chickens and goats as well and he's just I just love that little guy. He's so in the thick of it, you know, um his academic upbringing was a little bit slower. It turns out that he had dyslexia, but the whole time, right? His peer group, his age, whatever that means, they were doing the reading and their handwriting was was much higher, but he could we could go on a walk in the property or we're riding the zero turn mower. And he's like, no, dad, don't run over that. That's actually uh, that's medicine right there. That's good if you have an infection. You know, he knows all the plants. He knows how to tend to the livestock and he definitely can take something from seed to fruit better than his old man. So 
those are some good skills to pass on to the youth as well. And a majority of the kiddos these days aren't learning anything like that. They're learning how to scroll and, and gossip more than they are how to, how to take care of a, of a property. Yeah, the young ones are going to be, they're not going to be as affected as somebody who's already lived through the good times of, you know, like the economic prosperity of America was legendary really at its time. So when it's come through its peak and it's in the decline, a couple of points, like I'd traveled to Japan this time and the last time I'd gone, it was the exchange rate was 100 to 1 and this time it was 150 to 1. So everything was 50% me cheaper for me as an American with dollars changing over there. But for the Japanese, it was tumultuous and they were internalizing and there was a lot of just very sorrowful, very kind of like not happy before the last day, you know, because Japanese are very lucky, happy go lucky, at least in the cities. A lot of them, and you just hear a lot of laughing when you're in Japan. You see you know, a lot of people smiling, holding, you know, it's like, especially if you're in the springtime and everything's, this time it wasn't like that. It was very... uh no, everything, you could just feel, you could cut it with a knife in the society. And we went wow. to Croatia also, and they had moved over on January 1st from using their native kuna, was the last day to cash in your money, and then they moved to 100% to the euro, and everything doubled in price. As In the last two weeks, they would only let you go to the central bank in Zagreb to change your money. So anybody else holding dollars or, you know, kuna in the country... If you didn't get up to Zagreb in the last two months or two weeks and change it, then you lost it. It was worth zero. Like we had a couple hundred US dollars from the last time we'd gone, it was incredibly cheap. And then we missed the the date on it because we thought we could change. And we're in split. It's a big city. We're like, okay, we could change here. And they're like, no, you need to go to Zagreb where you just came from to change the money. And we're like, ah, you're on a holiday. You can't change anything. Why'd you make the last day to change anything? Is during like religious holidays through Europe. Like that's crazy. They stole everybody's money. And then the last thing I want to say is we went to Hungary also, and they're running at 10%, 10% food inflation per month. So 40% up since the beginning of the year, they were expecting another 10% over the next four weeks or so. Your access to food through the traditional system of going into, like we have a real small town Walmart here. And I went into, uh, I needed a, an extension cord and we were kind of near there. So I thought, let me jump in. We'll get some garden stuff anyway. Some seed packets and things from Burpee and what uh I went there. There were 50, five, zero of those drive in and they give you your food or give you your uh, whatever you ordered online. 50, five, zero. And I told you I live in a town with like a thousand people. And if you drive up to the next town, it's a few thousand people. And you're telling me 50. So, you know, the story, John, was going like this. Target is already starting to lock up everything in the store. I even did a video about this a couple of days ago. They're locking up everything behind glass, behind plastic. So it's going to go pretty much 100%. You need to order it. You're not even going to be physically allowed in the stores because all the crime. And really, when the food theft starts in the supermarkets, they're definitely locking everything up. So... Look around your local Walmarts or your local whatever Target stores or any kind of big box stores. Could be Home Depot, could be anything. And look for those massive amounts of new parking spaces going in where it is park your car and we'll bring everything out to you from the store. There should not be 50 parking spaces in a little tiny town like this for remote or delivery pickup for everybody buying stuff. Impossible. Even at the height of COVID, they had 19. 19, because I heard about this story going through, look for all these extra parking spaces or whatever for people picking up. And I did. I went there a while and I was like, ah, there's only 19. Those are the original old ones from the COVID time. 50 now. So mm -hmm. if you think you're going to have your food availability, I don't know. I might just say that's not in the future. I think going to be very possible that we have the same freedoms and allowances to just run into the store unchecked and buy what we want and come back out unmolested. I don't think I think those days are quickly coming to a uh, head here. Well, yeah, I mean, that's what they want with the Great Reset for everyone to just stay behind their computer and the virtual reality now, right? That'll be, you could go to the grocery store if you need to view a selection through the virtual reality, and then it'll get Amazon drone shipped over to you. Uh, I just was in Dallas, Fort Worth. So we're in Bastrop. I go into Austin uh, maybe twice a month, once a month to visit. My family's all in Austin, you know, so for the nephew's birthday or hanging out with my mom, Um and that's basically the only time that I ever go into a major city unless I'm traveling. But I went to Dallas, Fort Worth for about five days for a conference. And I noticed for the first time I went into a CVS and every single item that was like $10 or above was behind one of these 
plexiglasses and you have to press mm-hmm. a button in order to alert the teller. And nowadays too, at CVS, there's a teller standing there and they still have the register, but then there's all these automated registers. So you check out, right? And then you can put that infrastructure in place and then it shifts into a, a personal carbon allowance. You're only allowed a certain number of carbon credits and a carbon output. Then it starts to restrict your mobility. Um, that's a big piece. Central bank digital currencies, digital ID, social credit scores. That's that whole setup. But you know, let me ask you this. Um, for a while, I had the thought. Early on, I thought it's all going to collapse. It's coming down. I started to study economic collapse and Austrian economics uh, and started really diving deep on the Federal Reserve and, and money creation. It was like 2006 or so. And me and a friend were, were diving deep. He was really into the preparedness stuff. And he freaked out and thought that the system's collapsing any day now. And he took out a bunch of credit cards and bought a bunch of survival gear. And then he moved to a friend's place in Arizona. Um, and sure enough, you know, we did have the 2007, 2008 housing crisis deal. So I guess we were kind of close, but that wasn't a full out collapse. And as time went by, and even though there was so much financial chicanery, funny money, pr- endless printing of money, and then they even took away the uh, reserve ratio, the 10 to 1 reserve ratio, I kind of got desensitized to it and shifted my perspective as I started learning about the Great Reset as well and thought that maybe instead of a cataclysmic, catastrophic flash in the pan collapse, it would be a slow and gradual transition into the Great Reset say by 2030. I think they're way off on those numbers in in the US at least, or it's places like Texas, that's for sure. So it's not going to be a collapse. It'll be most of the, we will see it coming, but even maybe we'll be frog in the boiling pot too. And it'll go slow for us too, because we're just slowly but surely watching it. But most of the masses, they'll just wake up one day and their kids are, are born with digital ID, right? And a social credit score, this, that, and the other. But more recently, especially with this, this recent crackdown on cryptocurrency privacy tools. I'm now my thinking is, and then of course what's going on in the Middle East and Ukraine, Russia, but more so the Gaza Israel thing has got me worried more than the Russia, Ukraine, although Russia has nukes, of course, but so does Israel. They're not going to attack us. But um, what now I'm thinking is that because we've had so much success as a freedom community, because these tools like Bitcoin and Monero exist to upset their central bank digital currency agenda, which is a really critical piece, I think that they're having to accelerate their plans because they thought they could just railroad everybody into the gulag and nobody's going to resist. But there's been these massive uprisings and, you know, Trump, love them or hate them or whatever. There's these populist movements that are more conservative and patriotic and leaning. And that definitely it can be co-opted, of course, but it definitely throws a gear in their deep state globalist program. So I've kind of gone back and forth to where I thought it was going to be collapsed back in the day. Then I kind of got desensitized. Maybe they got this more Fabian socialist subtle agenda. But then because so many people woke up, I'm more worried now. I mean, like I said, we're going to be okay. But I, I fear that they're going to really push hard, kind of like a, a wild animal that's backed into a corner. That's when they're the most dangerous. And I think that's kind of what we're vibing on right now. Well, what if I started off a conversation with you and said, you know what, we're going to have to take all the wealth from the West because this 400 year cycle and the sun is going to bend the jet streams and you all just won't be able to grow as much food. So we're going to take all the wealth of the nations that would collapse anyway, because the way we do valuations and corporation thing won't just won't work anymore because the uh, the economic activity is going to continue to tra- contract, you know, depending on where the crop zones are and and how this international trade is going to be disrupted along with fiat currency. So we need to take all the wealth and value and move it over to places like Africa where we can set up new grow zones. How do you like that? Is that a great idea? Hell no. Everybody would say no in a second. So what we're looking at is a slow milking of wealth and transference of wealth termed as the BRICS. BRICS pay, BRICS aligned nations. They have to take the entire world's wealth and move it into the new area to set up the new A, debt system, to start it from scratch again once this other one is completed but the reason they need to do it, you think they just woke up on a Tuesday and said, hey, we need to redo the entire financial system and, and reset the planet just because it's Tuesday? No, they know there's heavier, more powerful cycles coming in with vibrational frequency changes that will allow <clears throat> us as humans to see through 
their darkness and see them for what they are. This is the time clock you're talking about and referencing that they're racing against. So you got to extract as much wealth as you can without kind of alerting the herd that we're going to reset up everything over in different areas, the Middle East, North Africa, the Sahel region. We're going to push it over to India and we're going to keep China chugging along because all these other nations, these five eyes are unviable as a as an asset. So what do you do? Well, you would cut your losses and then if you're going to put a stop loss somewhere, yeah, you know, you're going to lose a little bit, but it'll stop out. You'll still keep a majority of instead of losing all. So the same thing, in my opinion, is happening. These same people that are pushing the agendas for all this global change understand the solar cycles and the civilization cycle better than any. And they understand we're back at it. I mean, this apex of these four gas giants coming up in October of this year, 2024, that'll be the beginning. And then in 2032, they come by. They're not exactly a square again. But that whole 10-year period of <clears throat> electromagnetic changes, something significant is happening, and it's all predicated on the movements of the heavens that they're also racing against. Human awareness rising is one thing. But the energetics of our star changing, the, the frequency, the Brooklyn current flowing through our regional neighborhood that our solar system is transiting through right now, it's vibrating faster. The Yugas talked all about this Indian Vedic text and the Yugas as we go around the cycle. So if you have something that was invented in, say, the dark iron age of the 16 or 14 or 1300s, and we're vibrating so fast now that that just it can't even exist anymore because it's so dense. This is what the old system of we understand banking, fractional reserving, using wars in the petrodollar. That's so dark and dense that it just it doesn't it can't exist anymore. The vibrational frequency is changing enough. And that's the whole reason we're going to central bank digital currencies. You know, it's faster. It's lightning fast. It's Aquarius. It's moving. It's flow. So old clunky systems got to go. There I did an, I, I did a Dr. Zeus rhyme on the Great Reset. There you go. You can pen that one down and then put it out there as a tweet, anybody. But that whole system is being gradually milked. Gradually milked. It's not going to be, in my opinion, I agree with you, it's not going to be just one like giant flash in the pan. Although well, there will be events to kind of like throw a flashbang over there or an M80 or something to scare the, the herd to make them come back this way. But it's not going to be everything collapses at once because the BRICS is being set up outside this. I got to see it firsthand. People don't want the dollars anymore. They really don't. They're trying to divest themselves from dollars every way, shape, or form they can. And Japan was the biggest one. They divested billions and bought gold. But then because after World War II, we'd set their currency up on having the U.S. dollar bond, the treasury bill as the bedrock of their currency to issue off of, the more they subtract out of treasury bills, the more it contracted their economy, or they would have to print themselves, and that's why they're getting the inflation. But I think they did a smart thing. They took about $200 billion, sold the treasury bills, and bought gold. That's Japan. You got all these people across China right now saying, buy one gram of gold. For the last six, eight months, they were telling their citizens, buy a gram of gold. Well, it worked. About 800 tons worth of one gram gold pieces are split throughout China now. Now they're telling their citizens to buy silver because the central bank needs to accrue more gold. So if you think this BRICS thing isn't for real and this whole shift of wealth is not moving that direction, I am for here to tell you myself, I've witnessed it. There's a gigantic change, but it's not going to be instant. They're pulling and siphoning all the wealth out slowly. You got to stay one step ahead of that. And you got to pull back everybody in the challenges. Not a lot of people have the mental capacity to think on that level because they're caught in the micro moment of how am I going to put the money together to pay next week's rent? So they don't even have the time to contemplate, pull out and look at big giant debt cycles and big energetic cycles uh, and, and climate cycles. Uh, and that's how people are all in trance. So. Yeah. What, what do you think about um, spending energy as a freedom lover, as a as a truth person uh, to wake people up? Or do you think we should just need to circle the wagons and figure out how we as a freedom community can take care of ourselves? It'd be great if you could circle the wagons because a lot of people aren't ready to wake up because you've been like that. You know, even me, if somebody's not ready to, and you tell them the information, they're just going to glaze over and either try to never talk to you again because they don't want to hear it. It's too, it's too like stark and in their face or they're kind of integrated, but uh, it's not something you're willing to talk about. They just kind of blank out, you know, and you're one of those people, but they're going to come knocking at our doors. 
when this thing goes down and it gets really expensive for food or not, food's not available, they are going to come to your community. They're not, there's no way they're not coming out there. Let's put it this way. So then more the, the strategy is then what happens when they do arrive? Then that's why I was asking you some questions before we started here talking to like, what's the vetting process? I know a lot of people, this is, and again, same thing. Like if you're going to get somewhere and start to help people, you want to be there before the chaos occurs. Cause at that point you're just like, can we really trust you? Just, you're just here because it, it collapsed and you're just here because it's expensive and you can't eat. Now you didn't love this. This wasn't your passion. You're just here because you're necessity. You know, you need to get out there before it's a necessity. But I am a thousand percent sure seeing all these paintings across Europe. One thing I got in my, you know, I'm way out here at the edge of the Cherokee National Forest in East Tennessee. Like there's millions and millions and millions of acres behind here. This is the last stand. Like you can't go any further until you come over North Carolina and go to the beach, right? So I always thought this would be my last stand. Like I am not leaving here. There's no way. But one thing I kept seeing again and again and again in the paintings from the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s, 1700s, when armies came, they scoured the land, every inch of land. They left no stone unturned. When an army goes through your area, there's nowhere to hide. So you got to think about you in that situation leaving. But at the same time, you got to take that same mind frame of those people just lost all they had. Like it, they lost their economy. They can't pay their rent. They can't buy food. Now they're on the move. Now they're going to come out and they are going to find you. As much as that army through the last five or 600 years finds every stone and they turn it over because they're looking for combatants or whatever under it. The same people are going to start scarfing and looking around for food. And again, you know, the rules of social discourse and morals are going to change during this time. They are going to steal for food. Mark my words, they will. People that are not set in the stories of history of what people would do for their children or themselves. I mean, you, this is the thing that would need to get ready. You could circle the wagons, but people are going to be, you know, probing from every single side as those wagons are circled. So, you know, this is the thing I have this conundrum with of how much trust to put out there. Because people are, once it comes to that point, can you really trust anybody that wasn't there before the chaos started? So I guess I didn't even answer your question, but I just kind of ran a circle. I could be a politician. I didn't answer the question, but I just circled around <laughs> it. No, um, I think it's important too, to have that trustworthy squad in place because, uh, you know, it, a lot of the the roving marauders, I mean, a lot of this stuff plays out in fiction, but also in history. Um, but more recent stuff like The Walking Dead, for example, um, you know, a lot of different there's like these tribes that form. And I think one of the things that we're trying to do with the Freedom Cell Network. So folks haven't heard of it. It's called the Freedom Cell Network. There's over 41,000 people globally. Now, mind you, that's 41,000 people that have registered on the website in the past four years or so. Uh, not all of them are active, and it was around 1,000 people before COVID. It's one of the reasons why I think they totally miscalculated that whole campaign, and then it went from 1,000 to 20,000, 30,000 during COVID, and now we have another 10,000 or so. But the vision that we have, it's just basically like people get together, they work together, they grow food together, they get the kids together, they're raising the kids together, they're trading amongst one another. Uh, my companies, we have about 20 or so contractors and staff that work with us full time, part time, just small bits. And almost I'd say 90 percent of them I've met through this Freedom Cell Network. Anyone can join for free. Freedomcells.org is the website. Freedomcells.org. But one of the things that I'm hoping to spur is people have their micro community or their homestead with the neighbors that they're really close with, or ideally they have their property and, you know, another three, four, five families on the property. And so that has its own level of security there. But the way that we take things to the next level is we then link up in a decentralized way, a network with this homestead, this intentional community, this single family here, this homestead's got four families. There's a bunch of young dudes here. This is a, that's a, mainly families here. So maybe the younger guys need to go support them. Uh, there's, there's a lot of single women there and a lot of children, whatever kind of deal. And then this is in Tennessee, which the freedom community and freedom cells specifically are very organized in Tennessee. Um, Tennessee is a great place to be. Uh, Texas, of course, too. So we got a big pocket of this in central Texas. And so the idea is to kind of create a decentralized confederation of freedom communities. 
that way you got your crew and you guys are tight knit and you trust each other more than you even trust the rest of us that are part of the community. But we do have an elevated level of trust from Joe Schmo and the marauding gang of thieves down the road. Um, and so that, you know, that also kind of serves as a safety net, a safety network to where we can start this now. We don't have to wait until crap hits the fan to activate this tribe. We can support one another now. We can form the trade relationships now. We can actually carve out trade routes now. That's something me and my good friend Derek Bros, he's the co-founder of this network. We do talk about it a lot. We do need to step into action. Um, but we we are foreseeing like creating trade routes because he's based in Mexico. That yeah, that's the kind of thinking that I'm I'm going on. There, we gotta have strength in numbers. We are going to have to replace these systems, but even the word replace isn't the best word to use because I think we should preemptively decouple ourselves from them. Even if the legacy system sticks up around us, even if they shift it into the CBDCs or they shift the wealth out of there, whatever, we got to still, we shouldn't wait for them to do that because that debt-based, unethical, evil system, this beast system doesn't deserve our allegiance in the first place. So even if it collapses or not, we need to be decoupling ourselves and exiting their systems and building these alternatives, uh, if anything, so we can create a legacy of liberty for for our kids and for the future generations. Yeah, and that's <laughs> so a lot of these points you're going to talk about at the land. So was that May 17th through the 19th? Yeah. Yeah. May 17th, 18th and 19th is the formal conference. And then if you come in person, we still got a limited number of tickets on the 16th and 20th, we go out to various homesteads and farm operations here in Central Texas. And the cool thing is you visit the farm on the 16th and on the 20th, and the food that you eat during the event, a good chunk of it is sourced from some of these farms. So really trying to showcase and highlight the homestead lifestyle, uh, especially the community homestead lifestyle. But yeah, it's 17th, 18th, and 19th. People can sign up absolutely for free and watch the first day and a half totally free, tons of value. Mike Adams will be speaking on the first day. Uh, or you can get a virtual immersion pass. So then you watch the whole three events, the whole three days. There's workshops on Sunday. You get replays if you can't watch it live, a bunch of bonuses as well. And we like see these TVs. I don't know if we're going to bring these TVs or a TV I have from home, but we put the Zoom participants up on a big screen so the audience can see them, they can see the audience. And then the Zoom participants have the opportunity to ask questions of some of the speakers. That's why we call it a virtual immersion pass. It's kind of like you're there. I learned it from Tony Robbins and big marketing events that I would go to. They got these big screens of Zoom participants. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. So we're, we try to emulate that in our own little way. But the best way to experience the event is to show up in person because there's some really tight-knit relationships, networking. There's been romantic relationships that formed two land summits ago. A couple met, and they've since had a baby. So that's pretty cool. They met at the event um, and there's a lot of business relationships and the whole thing is centered around bringing people together to empower them, equip them with tips, tools, and knowledge, but also to connect them with other people that are looking to work on similar projects. Maybe they can work on projects together. It's very consciously about cultivating relationships. Exit and build land summit.com. On your dial. Make sure you head over there. Check out that. Say hi to John. 